Welcome to Furious Driving and today I'm sat behind a five cylinder engine, a T5 Volvo no less, but no, not one of the big wagons. This is a Volvo C70 T5, one of perhaps only 20 left in the UK. Listen to that engine, it's amazing. Now if you like reviews of interesting, different, unusual cars, then make sure you smash, smash I tell you, that like button and the subscribe one, most important. Now, a word from our sponsor and on with the review. Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the Furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk. So we've had quite a few Volvos on the channel and we've had quite a few Coupes on the channel but I don't think we've ever put the two together at the same time so what a way to do it with this, one of the rarest cars on the UK's roads, a Volvo C70 T5. And this is a level of rarity I'm kind of familiar with because like my 200 VI and Rover 420 Tourer, there's only about 20 of these left on the road which is properly rare. So let's take a look around this first generation little piece of art. So what is it? Well, the C70 is based on the Volvo 800 series, the 850, which is the car we actually have featured on the channel about a year ago. Um, as a solid, dependable, if unexciting car. They wanted to go a different way with this. They wanted to make it stylish and exciting. They wanted a pretty car that a family could enjoy going out together in for the day. A family of up to four though, because that's how many seatbelts there are. And so they finally threw out the rulers for this one. They made big changes and brought in the curves. And the man who did that was Ian Callum, who was a man familiar with a curve or two. He did the Jaguar XK, Aston Martins. He did the Ford PM for crying out loud. So he knows his way around a swoopy bit of metal. One Volvo design executive is in record as saying, we wanted to throw away the box and keep the toy inside. So they wanted a car that was good to look at and even better to drive. And of course, be amazing to be in as well. So the interior team was headed up by Jose Diaz de la Vega. They did a really run nice job Job using traditional Volvo styling cues and making it a bit more modern and a bit more curvy and swoopy and well late 90s-y. The C70 was revealed to the world at the 1996 Paris Motor Show and on sale the same year as the coupe. A year later it was on sale as the convertible and a year after that available in America. However they didn't last the same length of time because the coupe did not sell as well as the convertible. In fact the sales figures were about two to one in favour of the convertible which ran on another three years until 2005 before the generation two with a folding hardtop rather than the fabric roof replaced them in 2006. Now both the convertible and this the coupe do follow the same beautiful flowing lines. There are elements of BMW 8 series here in this quarter panel and Omega in fact in this double curve with a crease swage line down the length of the car. Incidentally this car is in a colour called Cassis like the French liqueur. It's rather lovely and this is possibly the rarest colour to find one of these cars in. Under the bonnet we find Volvo's modular engine family with a variety of sizes from 2 litres to 2.4 starting with a 2.4 20 valve making 168 horsepower all the way up to the T5 banging out 245. This is the penultimate example which is a T5 five cylinder turbo making 240 horsepower and 330 newton metres of torque. That's supercar territory for horsepower and diesel territory for torque. If you're talking old money I think that's 240 foot pounds of torque. There's also a smaller run of two litre T5s destined exclusively for Italy, Turkey and Taiwan because of tax laws based on capacity. Now because this is based on the 800 platform the boot is absolutely vast it goes all the way back to there so you can fit a ton of stuff in here the seats don't fold but there is a ski hatch in the center and underneath here you've got a proper full-size steel spare wheel you've got a deep pocket here on the left hand side to lose items way down in the chasm a pit of I don't know what and scary things it's like a, a challenge in Star Wars to see what's down the bottom on the right hand side there's even a little tray area so things don't rattle around. Typically sensible Swedish and well thought out. And also just check out these incredible boot hinges. It's a work of art. I am slightly miffed. This car's got a crit air sticker on it. Mine didn't turn up till after I left. And it's rather lovely. The car still has its Squire Ferno dealer sticker in the back window as well as its Squire Ferno number plates front and back. In case you're in any doubt about the engineering standard of Volvos, this chunk of metal here is the boot closing handle. Never mind some plastic flimsy thing. You could drag the car with that. Okay, let's look around the interior of this thing. So first of all, it's got pull-out style door handles. 
and then more importantly, frameless windows. How cool is that? You know you're in a classy coupe when you have frameless windows. The rear windows, as you can see, are hinged on these two points here and it'll poppy out window on the back. So for such an expensive car, 31,000 pounds when it was new, it's a bit of a shame or a surprise not to have dropping glass in the back, just uh, popping open. But I guess, realistically, those won't be open that often, I, I imagine. Well, on the convertible though, they will have to be drop glass because the roof. Now, it is a very luxurious place to be. It's caramel, beige, chocolate and gray, all combined to make a very nice interior. Typically Volvo-esque, very safety conscious, quite stylish headrests, uh, very wide wraparound seats, so almost like sports seats, but they are sports armchairs, I think we should call this. Leather and Alcantara. The Alcantara has, of course, done the usual thing, wearing a little bit, as it does. Memory seats on both sides. Both driver and passenger have got electric memory seats, which is pretty cool. You can tell it was designed in the 90s. Just, just looking at this big, chunky plastic, this is such a 1990s style. And being Volvo, it has SIPs, a side impact protection system, which involves this extra area of steel all around the base of the car. So there's a little lip that jumps up just there, making it a tiny bit harder to get in the back, but hopefully protecting you in the event of a side crash. Now I will spend some time on this door because there is a lot going on in here. First of all, we've got a beige leather top giving a nice feel of luxury down there. Then below that, we've got Alcantara swathing the centre section and ensconcing some of the other things. Then we've got more, well, this is fake leather, I think, down here rather than real leather. In fact, if I'm honest, I think this is fairly convincing fake leather up top. And then carpet down the bottom. Now let's look at the stuff that's being ensconced. First of all, we've got a big door handled, solid plastic. Then we've got a different kind of plastic plastic, a grey 90s plastic with our window switches, auto on the driver's side but not on the passenger. Electric mirrors, a big cold metal door handle, solid and reassuring feeling. Then two speakers because we've got an amazing premium sound system in here. A fairly small cubby hole but then curiously little buttons for our fuel flap and to open the boot. Let's climb aboard into those oh so comfortable chairs. And look at, first of all, our epic tea shelf. If you want a mountain of rolled herring and uh, I don't know, whatever else is the, uh, the Swedish national drink, um, black coffee, I think, you've got so much acreage to put it onto. It is a strange feeling material. It's like the elephant hide texture, the kind of fake leather they used, but it's hard and shiny with a little touch of softness. I can't work out what it's pretending to be. Interesting stuff an incredible T-shelf landing zone. And while we're up here, we'll mention the Dolby Surround Pro Logic speaker in the center and additional speakers on the side because this car is absolutely loaded with toys. We've got this nice bit of wood over on the passenger glove box, chromey metal door handle to open it with. And we do have an extra cup holder down there. And the flock lining does just take you straight back to the 700 and the 900. And some things kind of never change. Even the exposed screw heads are a surprise on a car this expensive and, well, this recent. It does shut with a reassuring thump, though. The air vents are more of that big, chunky, grey plastic as we saw on the seat controls. And of course, being a Volvo, there's a ton of control and adaptability. We've got flow, we've got direction, secondary flow for the second vent. We've got choice of cool air or not from these centre vents. An unusual thing to have so late on. It was a common thing which is actually complained about when it was missing from some cars 20 years before this, but almost unheard of these days. And moving across to our dial area. Now this is, again, the same shade of grey. It's an unusual colour for a dashboard. Very, very mellow, very subdued. It's not an aggressive, angry dashboard by any means. It's a calming, calming dashboard, which goes all the way to 160 miles an hour. So there's a little bit of uncalmness happening just there. Fairly simple, fairly restrained, typical Scandi minimalism going on here. Fuel gauge, which curiously has both gallons and litres marked on there rather than full quarter half empty that kind of thing actual physical amount in two different denominations water temperature speed and our rev counter red lining at six and a half thousand rpm a digital clock underneath there and pulling back from that we've got a delightful dark wood and leather rimmed steering wheel complete with srs airbag because safety we do have a horn let's power up for the horn test wow and suddenly the dashboard comes alive horn test Mm. With those twin horns at the front, that's a self-assembly parp. 
Now to the left and the right of the wheel, we've got banks of switches of secondary controls. On the right hand side, we've got headlamp level, front and rear fog lamps. Curious, ah, oh, that's interesting. Front ones go on with the solid click, rear ones are a push button so they go off with the lights. Screen dimming for the dashboard and our main headlight switch. To the left, traction control off and on. A slightly cryptically labeled sunroof button. Info, because there's a rudimentary trip computery thing which tells you stuff, currently averaging 30 mpg. And heated mirrors, how cool is that? And between the steering wheel and the dashboard, we have our stalks, which are interesting, giant plastic obelisks, chunky, massive things, really. This is our windscreen and, of course, headlight washer control on the right-hand side. And on the left, we've got lights, indicators and cruise. Now, moving into the centre, we've got lots of rather interesting stuff. First of all, our heating and ventilation. Obviously, it's dual zone climate, expensive car, as I've said. Air conditioning, of course. Um, all very sensible, chunky buttons, but not too chunky. So you can use these controls with gloves on, I imagine. Yeah, it gets pretty chilly in Sweden. And under that, this is a radio worthy of its own Wikipedia entry. This is a Volvo SC901 double din radio cassette and CD changer. Now this is quite exciting. Apart from all of the multi-functions like the pop-out, bass, treble and fader buttons down here, or dials, um, the many, many buttons down here, the audio cassette, RDS and Ian, we've got our CD caddy. Three discs can be parked in there, pop it in, and it does its loading thing. Do not touch the magazine during operation. It's quite clear about that. It takes a little while, actually. And then once it's done, that is the position it sits in if you want to leave it in the car. If you want to take it out, you've got nothing but your disc flap. Um, but if you want to leave it in there, because there's not really a stowage place for it in the car, unless you lose it loose in the glove box, it just pops out there like a little handle. Like you can open the front of the dashboard as if it was a small oven. Anyway, that's all surrounded by very nice wood indeed. A hazard light switch down here, big and chunky. Beneath that, we've got a large cubby area, big enough for a medium-sized phone or a good-sized Mars bar. We've got this, <laughs> a covered coin tray. That is something I've not seen before. Coin trays are plenty in the 90s for parking meters, but I've never seen one with a little covered flap on it. We've got a push to reveal a large ashtray, a massive ashtray. And this was possibly the deciding factor when the owner bought this car. This is Joseph from Lloyd's Vehicle Consulting is the owner of this vehicle. When he spotted the National Trust sticker in the window, he knew it had been well looked after. It's a very National Trust car, isn't it? We've got heated seats buttons down here. So you get bum warmers there. A vertical fag lighter for 12 volt output, which is a little inconvenient for putting things in, they're not the prettiest. Then we have an automatic transmission, there was a manual available as well. And this comes with three zones of use, sport, eco and winter. Winter is selected regardless of which mode you're in. A proper handbrake, this is nice to see. And then we have a big old armrest, and this is another little bit of interest, which I think you will find fascinating. There are two, what well, looks like two handles in the front, but one of them isn't a handle. It's a double cup holder with drop down base catches, which slide back in there when you're done. The small handle opens it. It looks like you're gonna have storage inside the arm itself, but I don't believe there is, unless I've just failed to find it. They have a really shallow little cubby here, not much a lot. But then, because OBD2 was a new and exciting technology, they stuck it here in the armrest with a big label on it, so you can pop that off, and your OBD is right there in the centre of the armrest, which is super handy. Who knew? Now, this was a family car, so should we make an effort to get into the back? Now, first of all, we have to lift that up, tip that forward, and then, there we go, it motorises itself very slowly forwards. And then you can climb into the back. It's more extreme luxury. Now this is how these seats would have looked when they were brand new, with this lovely fresh Alcantara, which looks like it's barely ever been sat in. It sways a bit around the sides. We've got leather armrests. Only two seat belts here in the rear, and they come out of the center, interestingly. I guess this is a hangover from the um, convertible as well. We have got a large, very soft padded armrest and that ski hatch that goes into the boot, of course. Great big speakers on the rear parcel shelf. 
So I'm guessing excellent sound. Now the headroom is actually fairly compromised. I guess because we've got a sunroof in this car, it does drop the roof down a touch, but I am touching my head against the ceiling. So not ideal, but we do have a courtesy light and a grab handle on both sides. More walnut, a 12 volt outlet, not a lighter, just a 12 volt outlet. No ashtray, just a plastic oddment tray, but a nice bit of, bit of timber. Right, five cylinder thrum. We do like a five cylinder thrum. There's one reassuringly familiar aspect of this car, which you may have noticed, these red flashing and indeed ticking seatbelt warnings. So you know you've got to do up everything and make sure you're safe because it's a Volvo. Can't be not safe in a Volvo. Just divine. I've owned a five cylinder diesel, I've never owned a five cylinder petrol, but there's always just something fantastic. I think I'll call it a Focus ST for the same reason, just for that noise, if nothing else. A slightly off kilter idle, it doesn't sound quite right, but it is just so perfect for weird reasons. So, this thing is a really good looking car on the outside, and the interior is also rather fabulous. It even has a secondary low level T-shelf. So this car really is covering as many bases as it possibly can. But when you're sitting in it, there's a very high dashboard. There's a bit of a, a cliff, a monolith in front of you. It stretches a long way to the dashboard because this coupe shape swoops and curves up from a long way away. It starts way down along the length of the bonnet and goes all the way into the boot. But it does mean that you're sitting in the very centre of the car in a relatively small cockpit area. And it feels like you're very low down and very far away and a little bit small here in the centre of the car. And in addition to that, considering everything is power assisted as you would expect it to be, it all feels quite heavy as well. Not leaden, but certainly solid, reassuringly solid. Now currently we're driving in eco mode and that gives us about 30 to the gallon average across all driving conditions. It's given the owner, Joseph, you know, an average of around 30 mpg, 30.4 in fact. But there's a sport button down here, as well as a winter option. Let's hit sport and see what that does. I believe it just changes the shift point so you change a little more aggressively and hold on to the revs a little longer. It is incredibly smooth pulling away. Just a little fine cylinder thrum. And something they were aiming for in the design process was to give it exemplary handling. Something that Volvos weren't necessarily known for before. And it does feel really very tight indeed going around these S-bends. It feels very flat, feels very composed, feels very neutral as well. So those designers did their work well. In fact, the suspension was tuned in collaboration with TWR, the, uh, the racing team who have been involved with Jaguar and other sort of performance manufacturers in the past. And in fact, there was a plan for some cooperation during the build phase as well. However, they fell out fairly early on. And so all the manufacturing came in-house to Udvala in Sweden. So the thing was built in the home country, in the home, one of the home factories. And this thing is astonishingly comfortable to be in. It's, these big sports armchairs are just the best when it comes to just soaking up miles and bumps. You just sit back into them and relax like nothing else. When you're not pressing on, the car is extremely relaxing to be in. You can tell it was specced by someone who wanted a relaxing car, this burgundy metallic cassis paintwork, all the beige interior, the wood, the wood rim wheel, all of this stuff. This is not uh, someone who's going to be going off chasing lap times around the Nürburgring. This is someone who wants to enjoy the finer things in life. And at £31,000 in 1998, that is definitely a finer thing. Now because this was based on an existing platform, a fairly common practice in the motoring industry to create a coupe from an existing saloon or hatch range, it only took 30 months start to finish to develop it. That's well, two and a half years basically to 
have this thing created. And you can absolutely forget all those old boxy Volvo, boxy but good kind of analogies and jokes because this thing is so curvaceous. If you look down the side of the vehicle, it's just non-stop undulations. It really is a beautiful bit of automotive sculpture. A very, very pretty car indeed. But it's not just beauty without substance because thanks to TWR's involvement, it does go around a bend pretty well. The hydraulic power steering does lend a fair bit of weight and feedback. The car feels incredibly stable. It's also very rapid with this engine. The uh, 240 horsepower T5 will throw it to 60 in 6.9 seconds and onto a top speed of 155 miles an hour. That's remarkable. What's more remarkable is the fact that the claimed MPG is only 25 and the current owner has mentioned to hit 30 out of it. Going around this bend, there's a little feeling of undulation as we go over the, the surface, but overall, it's a very smooth car indeed. The convertible does suffer with pretty horrendous scuttle shake, but this being a hard top, no such problems. But despite that monumental scuttle shake, the convertible outsold this to a remarkable degree. Around 72,000 of the Mark 1 C70 was built in all formats. But only 26,000 of those were the hardtops, which I would argue is the better car. Better on the road, better in a crash, although being a Volvo, there is tons of safety equipment in both this and the Cabrio. The Cabrio has got pop-up roll hoops, it's got boron A-posts. A I'm not sure if this has got boron A-posts as well, because it gives incredible strength. You can drop it on its roof effectively. Not that I'd suggest doing that, it's not quite so pretty as this. This really is a very pleasant place to be. And that five cylinder engine, which is the basis of the engine that went into the uh, Focus ST, is an absolute dream to be behind. So much power, so much tractability. Even in eco mode, it is willing to pull and pull and pull. Now the five speed manual, I would have imagined, is an awful lot more fun. But if you just want relaxing cruising in a purple car with a beige interior, uh, the automatic is probably the way to go. Well, I hope you enjoyed this look around what is one of the rarest now coupes in the UK. If you have, please, as always, hit like and subscribe and join me again next time driving something completely different. Let's face it, 90s cars were the best. You had mad stuff like cassettes for your CD headlight wipers all the good stuff that honestly makes life worth living.